thank God for this opportunity to struggle again with his words in Psalm 51. And I thank also Pastor Nam for the chance to uh, deliver the message today. And thank you for all your prayers. And I believe God already answered your prayer regarding my sermon. Um, I've taken my passage in Psalm 51 because while I was praying, um, I was reminded while um, back home, long time ago, maybe like some five years ago, uh, one person, or I think he, he, he is also a professor, and he's a pastor. Um, I don't understand why if we pray or we sing the song, Created Me a Clean Heart, or Renew a, a New Spirit, something like that. I can see, I observe him like his face was changed, and to the point that he went out. So I was really curious. And uh, maybe because of different uh, denomination or different belief. So this, um, this thing or this experience um, challenged me to, to study Psalm 51. What's really in, it's here in the Psalm 51? To remind everyone, Psalm is in Hebrew poetry. This is um, this is we can see the, the experience in by form. We can um, it is very effective also in preaching and meditating because mostly it is based on experience of the uh, writer or the psalmist. So before I'll go to the passage, uh, I would like us to, to look or to see my title, The Christian's Right Attitude for Confession of Sin. So this is also most likely my theme. When I mention right, definitely there is wrong. So is, is there such thing as a wrong attitude of confession of sin according to study or biblically as I um, meditate the message as I read uh, the Bible uh, I'm going to give you some biblical references uh, regarding the wrong or the bad attitude for confession of sin so First, I'm going to give an example or illustration in the life of Saul, King Saul. He was the first king of Israel who was anointed by God. At first, he's doing very well in his um, kingdom, in his um, ministry as a king. But then, because of uh, uh, jealousy, when we read the story, there's kind of jealousy that stick in his heart, in their innermost being. Because it was started when David uh, always go home from war, that uh, the women or the people in the kingdom always shout that uh, Saul killed 10,000 enemies, but David killed more than uh, Saul. So because it is he had this jealousy in his heart that I believe it continued, it, it really stick in his heart. And that's this the reason why he sought or he pursued David and he wants to kill him. And uh, in Samuel 26, 21, he said that 
I have sinned. Return my, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. But what makes this wrong attitude for confession of sin? It will be seen or it will be revealed in chapter 7, verse 1, when uh, David said like, um, he has still this, he, he still feel the threat in him until he felt like he, he has this threat, his life um, is in danger unless he will go to the Philistine, to the land of the enemies. And that's what happened also. Uh, it was confirmed when um, Saul said that, in, the, in chapter seven it said like, Saul stopped the, the pursuing pursuing uh, of David to kill him. So it's not really right confession when he said that uh, I have sinned because he still want to pursue, he still want to kill David. And another example is also, I will also go in the New Testament, is the very good example here is the life of Judas Iscariot when he betrayed Jesus Christ. When we, go, when, when we are going to meditate the narrative, it says like, it seems like he also um, really regret, he regretted, it, it said there, but actually in his action, he didn't really um, confess his sin to God. So what, makes this a wrong attitude of confession when he went to the priest after betraying Jesus Christ he went to the to the Jewish priest and then he, he returned the 30 uh, 30 shekel of silver but then his action was different why because as we all know, he hanged himself. So I believe this is not the right attitude of confession. It's not a true confession before God. And then another one is the tax collector. The, the parable when Jesus Christ uh, said that there were two men went into the temple to pray. One, the Pharisee, and one was the tax collector. They, they prayed. But what makes the wrong attitude for confession of sin in this narrative? Because we can see in the content of the prayer. So remember, even we pray, even we confess our sins, let us always check the content of the prayer. So what was his prayer? The, phar the Pharisee, he mentions all his good deeds, that he gives his tithes, he helps the poor. And then, what's wrong? Uh, how can we know that his confession of sin, is, his prayer is not right? It's because when he saw the tax collector, he compares himself to the tax collector and he said, I am not like him. He is a sinner. So sometimes in our lives, even us in our in application our li in our lives, we always see what we do. I, I, I did like this, I did like that. And then we all we tend to compare with others and even see the fault of others and this is not the right attitude for the confession of sin. The reason why I give this one is for us to really understand our passage. The Christian's right attitude for confession of sin, if we're going to 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 put it in a question is what does 
having the right attitude mean in our passage in Psalm 51? Always remember, we are talking in Psalm 51. When we read in Psalm 51, it says like, we have already idea that there is a context in the prayer of David or the psalmist because the title said that for the director of music, a psalm of David when the prophet nation came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So if we are familiar with the story, the story wherein God said to Nathan, the prophet Nathan, to go to David to tell him that he sinned against God. And prophet Nathan went to him and he had this wisdom. How can he, will, how can he uh, will relay his message to the king? So he made a parable, he made a story. So that's the reason even David, he was, uh, he himself said like, in that story that who is the, that person who wants to get, who wants to, you know, uh, he's poor, he has one, one uh, animal, but still the rich person wants to, to get that one and serve for the visitor. So it's very oppressing. There's a scene of oppression there because in that parable, David was very angry and he said that he deserved death. And he said like, Nathan said, it is you, it is you. And what was his attitude after that one? After Nathan point out to him, uh, relay the message to him that he sinned against God. So from our title, what are the Christians' um, right attitude? We can see in verse one, um, to recognize, recognize, the recognize the seriousness of the sin before the Lord. In verse one it says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. So even in his first sentence, his, he was very direct. He's very sure that he's seen against God. So from here, we already have an idea that he recognized his sin. David recognized that he sinned against God. And he wants what? Another right attitude for confession of sin is re he repented. After recognizing his sin, he repented. There is no when I read the message, we cannot see like the word repentance or the word like forgive. But we can see through how he used the language. Like when he said, wash, in verse 2, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So he used the cleansing, wash, to wash. He used, seems like there's some water involved there that washing away the sin of David. He said like, we can see here even in verse three, for I know the transgression and my sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. So he uses three different words to describe his offense. We can see in verses two and three, that is iniquity, sin, and transgression. Why? 
is there is there a big difference the psalmist or david wants to emphasize by definition whatever definition of sin and offense every definition he committed wrongdoing against god that's the reason he uses the complexity he wants to to tell to to the reader those who's reading this one his audience that the complexity of his sins the gravity of his sins it's really very deep why is it very deep again let's go back to the context it was because when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. He premeditated to kill her, her husband, Uriah. And he didn't stop there. He even lied. So, his sins really are overlapping with each other. It's becoming grave. It's become deep, too much. That's the reason when, when he was praying this, when he was confessing this, Psalm 51 to God, even in verse 4, he says that against you, you only have I seen and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justify when you judge. When we observe the language, when we observe the text, he always use personal pronoun. Me, my iniquity. He's not saying about it's your iniquity, it's others' fault. It is my transgression. It is my sin. This is very important. Because most of us, even nowadays, when we sin against God, we, can, we don't recognize right away. We don't repent right away. We, we tend to blame others. We tend to think something like, it, like what she said. We, it's easy to lie. Sometimes we choose to lie than to tell the truth. Because we don't want others to blame us. But we don't know we are sinning against God. We want to please others, but we do not please God but here the intensity the, the, the gravity the sin of David adultery lust it started with the lust L-U-S-T maybe this is the reason even when I was meditating the word of God it says there's sin really that it's really difficult to cleanse, it's hard. It needs really, um, it needs really crying out and really action and praying to God always. Because in adultery or sex, out even sex outside marriage, the sin is entering in your body enters to our body. Sometimes you say, ah, everything, when we lie, we see it, it seems like, is there any small and big sin? Small and big sin, is there any? All our sins, right? But there is what you see, gravity, how deep your sin. That's the reason it, we can see here in the Psalm 51, 
David, when David recognized his sin and he repented, he repeatedly saying that he sinned against God. He committed transgression against God. Blot out my transgression, David said. Why? Why? Then as we continue, by the way, when we see a verse 1, have mercy, he said in Hebrew, this is the, the kindness, you know. And when we see in verse 4, he said like, when it's God judge, it is really true. He proved that his judgment to his people is true. That's the reason, compared to verse 1, he was not praying of justification. He was pleading of mercy of God. Why? Because David, David knows that if God will give justice in his sin, then he will die. That's the reason he plead for God's mercy. By the way, when you always plead for God's mercy, you know that you did wrong in your life. And only the mercy of God can cleanse your unrighteousness. David knows it. That only God's mercy, God has said, loving kindness will blot out, will cleanse his sin. And then in verse 5, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. When, when I'm reading this, it seems like, what does he mean in here? So David knows his theology. He knows that since birth, it's not like his mother had a, a mistake or sin. That's why when he gave birth to him, so he also sinned against him. But because he knows that even in birth, he was still in the womb of the womb of his mother. His already sinful. The Bible said that. And then, surely, in verse 6, you desire truth. So there's comparison here. The movement of the language here, negatively, in verse 5, when he said that he was sinful at birth, sinful from the time his mother conceived him. And then in the verse 6, the movement was it it was positive because surely you desire truth in the inner parts, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. So he's also sure that God himself desire the truth in his people desire he wants the truth in his people so by the way in in other version in king james surely here it, it was his behold behold this is to to catch the attention of the readers or the audience but when you read this one, you will say, why? It says, behold, for us to really dig and see what it means or what it meant. And then in, in another attitude, another uh, right attitude in, uh, for confession, for sin, Sight of recognition or recognize, to recognize that your sin, to repent before the Lord, is also He desire restoration. 
he didn't stop. He didn't stop in just recognizing the, the seriousness of his sin. He did not stop. He did not stop in repenting continuously to God. He wants restoration. He wants to be restored. So in verse 7, it says, Cleanse me with high soap, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. He didn't ask forgiveness here, but he asked for cleansing. He asked for cleansing. And high soap, or his soap, here, it was mentioned six times in the Bible. And the sixth, the last one was during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, when he was asking for water, but the, the Jews gave him vinegar. This is a kind of uh, plant, plant. So this is the high soap, and we, maybe there's also a, um, Representation in this high soap is part of cleansing, part, part of purging of sin. So he, he used the word his soap to, instead of the forgiveness, he used the uh, metaphor or the word his soap to uh, for us to understand that we need forgiveness from God. We need cleansing from God. Let me, verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have Christ, you have crushed, Rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Why is it that um, David used even the bones? Let the, my bones you have crushed. You see, when we go to Hebrews uh, 4.12, it says like, you know, the, the word of God, you know, can penetrate even to the division of the soul and the spirit in the bone marrow. So it might be his sin because of his, the deepness of the seriousness of his sin. It's like already, it's already in the bone. It's already in the bone that only when God will break it, have to break it, that's the time he will be cleansed if it will be broken. So here we can see even the way he, he asks forgiveness for, to God, it's really giving us an idea that he was really broken. One by one he was saying that the gravity of his sin. He, my sin is very serious. That only God can forgive. And he said again, blot out all my iniquity. So he really prayed to God to blot out his sins. And then verse 10, the very, you know, I think we know all this one because we are always singing. The create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create. It brings back in the Genesis 1 when God created the world, when God created human. The same bara. It was used here. 
create in Hebrew. The same in Hebrew. The, it was used also the same word. So, when God created us before the fall, the man is pure. So, here in verse 10, create in me a pure heart. So, he was telling that like when he created the uh, human being, the first Adam, that God will create a pure heart in him. He didn't say that cleanse my heart. When you observe the, long, the, the text, he didn't say that cleanse my heart. But he said create in me a pure, uh, pure heart. Then it's only God can create a pure heart. Bring back again in Genesis when he created first Adam when they didn't commit sin. So, he wants God to create in him a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me means like so that he can be firm he will, his firm, unwavering faith, his faith will be firm in God. He needs restoration so that his faith will be firm again. It will be, uh, it will not waver. Even there will be another temptation in his life. He will not waver. So he's asking God to give him unwavering spirit or steadfast spirit very firm spirit firm with the truth and in 11 do not cast me from your presence or take your holy spirit from me i think i remember the pastor the reason why he doesn't like this song because i this this song the prayer the holy spirit in me because he believed that the holy spirit will not Come and go. But I think he didn't understand this one. He's, he was not saying, because the Holy Spirit, it was mentioned uh, thrice in the, in the Old Testament. Here in Psalm 51 and also in Isaiah, the Holy Spirit here is not, in the Old Testament is different from the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament testament is temporary it's not everyone will have the spirit of god like for example in the case of saul when god anointed him the spirit of god was with him but when saul did not obey him when he didn't follow the the instruction of god to him then God said, Yahweh, Adonai said to, to Nathan, to tell to Saul that he will remove the, the Holy Spirit from him and give it to the new, the next king, King David. So here it is clear that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, it's not for everyone. It's for um, um, selected person, the anointed, God anointed for, uh, to, for empowerment, to do a mission. Like even David, he has also a mission as a king. So he in, indwell. He that, that is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is different. When Jesus Christ already went to heaven, then the Holy, he said to his uh, apostles, that don't worry because the Holy Spirit will, uh, 
come will go down. And that Holy Spirit is permanent. So in the Old Testament, Holy Spirit is temporary. In the New Testament, they are enjoying the privilege of a permanent spirit, Holy Spirit of God. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So in 11, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. So that's uh, the explanation. And in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So the restoration here, he wants restoration here. When he said that you restore to me the joy of your salvation, it doesn't mean that when he sinned against God, his salvation was God. It means that because of the, his guilt, because of his transgressions, because of his sins, adultery, murder, lies, because of these things, what happened? His joy was God. His joy was God. That is what he's referring to this. Have you experienced this? If you know something that you did wrong in your life, have you even ex have you experienced like it seems like you don't have joy anymore? Because you know you have this guilt in your mind. Even though you tend to be happy, laughing and everything, if you had this sin in your life that you are not confessing to God, that you are not recognizing to God, that you don't want to be restored. It's a fake joy, actually. It's just a physical joy, but actually in your innermost being, you are not happy. Why? Because of the guilt. So you need God's restoration. So that's what David wants. He didn't stop and recognizing his sin before the Lord. He didn't stop and repeatedly re asking for, for cleansing to God, repentance. He wants restoration. And then after that, after that restoration, what? Then he will have right worship. That's the only time he will have the right worship to God. So in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. See? Even he said, after the restoration, he said in his prayer, he will be a witness. He will be a witness to others, to his kingdom, to his people. He will tell to them that about his sins. He will teach them what is really sin all about. He will tell them how God cleanse his sin, that only God will cleanse his sin. Only God can do and he said that one after his restoration then he will be a witness he will teach this his, what he learned regarding the true confession or the right attitude of his of confessing the sin 14 save me from the blood built of God so he continuously Pray, O oh God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. See, that's the time he can really rightly worship God after God will blot out his transgression. 
And then in verse 16, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it to you. Do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. You do not, I, I, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. In Old Testament, when we sing, when we, even when we study um, uh, the thesis of professor right, about the righteousness of God, that God wants holy people when you sin against that god they always offer the animals blameless animals for the offering but then even this is external offering he wants to tell to the readers that these offerings burnt offerings are just external if you do not what if you do not really have the right worship to God. It's just external. And what God delights, what God delights, your brokenness, a contrite spirit. He wants us, if we sin against God, if we sin against us, He wants us really to recognize he wants us really to, to repent, to really cry out for his mercy. Did you ask forgiveness to God in just saying, Lord, forgive me? It's just, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I have sinned like this. And then you do the same thing again. And then, Lord, forgive me. And then the same thing again you do. So it's like we are making it cheap, the forgiveness of God to us. We are making it very lightly. But then the right attitude of confession, for confession of sin, we can see in the life of David in Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So this is what God wants to us. Praise God. What, it, what is good news here? That even though our sin, our blood guilt, is like the color, you know, red, you know, he will make it like a snow the snow is very white so even david murdered his people even he committed adultery in continuously enjoying the pleasure when he realized his sin you know he was so broken. And his attitude of confess, confessing the sin to God, you know, he really prayed even the mercy of God, that, it, that God will cleanse him. That his attitude of really asking forgiveness to God, it's true, why? In the story, he didn't, even though there is consequence, there is always consequence in, in our wrong doing as what uh, we see in this passage. So, but even though he asked that his son should not be killed, should not die, but still he died because that is the consequence of his sin. So in application in us, in, in church, as a Christian, if we also continuously do sin against God, do not think that there will be no consequences. Even though you ask forgiveness to God in the right manner, still there is consequence. But the goodness is, He will cleanse. 
and he will create again a pure heart if that is what you desire in your life. Here when he said it, it is something personal in, 15, in verse 16 he's asking uh, and praying to God that God will uh, really cleanse him in verse 17 in verse 18 and 19 even though some scholars they are they're arguing that 18 and 19 should be it should not be here but then I think there is also connection because his worship the right worship to God he was also already praising praying Worshiping God in 1617, but 1819 is like in, in your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, hold burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. When he first have the, the righteous worship to God, then next will be his people. So it reminds him his duty, his mission. Because David, the covenant of God to him that the, it is in his line that his people will live forever. So if he, if he will have a right worship to God, then he can, the, the, his people also will learn from him and they will also have right worship to God. They will also uh, sacrifice not only in um, external manner, but also in the inner, in the innermost being. So in restoration, go back to restoration of the church, we can see that God really wants our inward, inward restoration inward um, cleansing it's not our outward that's the reason our heart the bible said also like guard your heart guard your heart because god sees our heart he he do not really delight in your external sacrifice if you are not right in your heart. So first, you have to have <coughs> the right worship to God, and then it will follow your external worship to God, your external glorifying to God. So it will just follow. So the Christian's right attitude for confession, just to wrap up, are first you have to recognize that you sin against God when Nathan went to David and he let him understand that he sinned against God David didn't say that no I did not sin no. he admitted he acknowledges his sin and then from here I realize that a, an anointed person who is known, he was a worshiper of God, a man after God's heart. He can also see this, this kind of grief, very grief sin, very deep sin. So meaning to say, in our application of our life, even ministers, even we are really, you know, trying to do holy before God, we have to be more careful. The more we are mature, the more the realization. For me, when I'm meditating this, the more we are mature in God, the more we have to be very sensitive with sin. The more we have to be 
more sensitive with the work of the Holy Spirit. Maybe the Holy Spirit is, tell, is telling you that, no, that is wrong, that is wrong. But because your flesh is stronger, we just neglect. And the worst thing is, because we neglect, even we say, ah, it's small sin, small sin, it will become bigger and bigger. The Bible said, do not taste, do not touch. Do not taste the sin. Do not touch the sin because you just wake up one day. You are already doing a very grief sin before God. But in our life, if we have that kind of sin, because we are still waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, we don't know what will happen. We don't know what is our future what will be our future. And if we commit sin to God, let us remember Psalm 51. If someone told you in the church, even not your pastor, even not someone in, your friends, your brothers and sisters, and tells you or rebuke you and say, like, I think what you're doing is wrong, then do not get angry if it is true. Because the person loved you. That's how God wants, that's how God, God's love to us. He wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to, to really know what we should do in our lives. So, in our church, we have to be careful. We have to be very careful. Even we say, nah, I know already. I know already the Bible. If someone will share you something, oh yes, I know that already. We have to be humble. Even David knows his theology, but he still committed one of the grievous sins in the Bible. So we have to be careful. We have to at least uh, acknowledge or see if what they're telling to us as long as it's true or it's they said nicely then we have to thank god because david he knows that he's doing the wrong thing but why is it that he continuously do sin becoming deep and deep but then when nathan came to him and said that he sinned against god he, he recognized he really repented to God. So even us, maybe sometimes, even in our mind, we are doing wrong things, but still we are doing it. So we need the account. We should have accountability with each other as a church. As what pastor preached uh, two, two Sundays ago, he said, like, we are the, a body. If someone is hurt, even just this, finger everyone is affected so do not think that we are not affected when we are not in good condition so that's the reason we always encourage each other that's the reason we ask oh how are you but when it comes also to to sin if we know that someone is doing wrong thing we have also to be accountable to each other we have also to talk to that person. That's true love. We don't just please and please others, sister, brother. But you know something they're, they're doing wrong, you are not even mentioning about it. The Bible is very strict when it, com it comes to sin. The Bible is very strict. So, recognizing this, recognizing the sin before the Lord, and then repent to repent before the Lord to restore, to to really want to have restoration in your life after your sin, after your confession, and that's the time you will have the right worship before the Lord. Uh, 
before we end, we, may I request everyone to stand up and let's sing the, the song Create in Me? Create in Me a Clean Heart. Who knows this? 